long. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So that should launch us into, you should be able to see a photography 101 there with the Southern Alleghenies Museum of Art logo. Does everyone see that? Yes. Yes. Perfect, great. So we are all in the right place. If you don't see that, that's okay. We can figure it out. But if you do, we're just gonna keep moving on. All right, so just a reminder, these are gonna be Saturdays at 11 a.m. So we're starting today and we're kind of rolling through to February 6th is our last like class, but then the 13th we'll have a discussion and sort of any miscellaneous information that you want. If everyone's like, I really, we all really wanna learn more about fashion photography. Let's do a little thing about it. Happy to do that. And also this could be an opportunity if you'd like to share work and talk about each other's work and have a little kind of relaxed afternoon together so that we can you know, really explore some of what we've been creating, that would be a great time for that. So we're gonna kind of keep a dialogue open about what February 13th looks like for us, but each of these weeks, we're gonna be really diving into the camera, um, its history, and also how you can use that in your practice. So welcome, uh, my name's Hannah Harley. I am the site coordinator at Southern Allegheny's Museum of Art in Altoona. Um, before that, I was an adjunct photography professor at Point Park University in Youngstown State. I've taught everything from photo for non-majors to advanced photography to photo theory courses. So um, anything you're kind of interested in within the realm of art photography um, and, you know, whether that's darkroom, digital, installation types of photography, I'm happy to chat about that with you. Um, I have my BFA in photography and my MFA. Um, and I've also been running a commercial photography business for the last six years or so. Um, and so we can absolutely talk about that and, you know, everything from licensing and insurance to your website. So we'll really be diving into those um, in one-on-one -on -one meetings. So let's say you really want to learn photography so you can take really good pictures of your cat or your grandchildren, or you want to get into wedding photography we're gonna have one-on-one -on -one meetings that you can really, you and I can really kind of hash out what you're looking to learn in this course and also kind of what your goals are so that I can help you get there. Um, you know, photography is a wonderful journey and these one-on-one -on -one meetings are gonna be that kind of dialogue that you and I have um, so that we can get you closer to where you wanna be. So um, you might have seen the email where I sent a Google form. If you registered like in the last 24 hours, you wouldn't have gotten that. Um, and whoops. So I'll send that Google form link again. Uh, but this Google form is just asking you what kind of photography you like and what you're interested in learning so that I can, again, tailor the class to what everybody's interested in. So if you could fill that out, that'd be great. Now books. So if you are like me, you sometimes in this virtual world, it's sometimes really fun to have a physical book. You are absolutely not required to get these. This is not something you need to buy, but I've found these two books to be really helpful. So this first one is read this if you wanna take great photographs. Straightforward, they're telling you exactly what it is off the bat, um, but they do everything from like teaching you about um, close-up photography and macro photography to um, different ways to consider the frame. It's beautifully laid out. It's really simple. And I think it's like 12 bucks. Um, so this is one of the ones that talks about composition and it's, you know, layering and composition. So this is a beautiful book. And, and you know, especially as we do all these virtual things, it's kind of wonderful to have a physical thing. Um, we won't be doing like readings from this or exercises, but occasionally I'll reference this as, as a kind of basis for the lesson. Um, but it's a really great tool for any type of photography that you're looking to learn. This is a really great tool. And then this one is The Short Story of Photography by Ian Hayden Smith. Um, again, you don't have to buy it, but if you're looking to learn more about photo history, this book is awesome. So it does everything from like looking basically at 50 of the most influential photographs to breaking down different photo theories, like this decisive moment um, is a really important photo theory that was um, Henri Cartier-Bresson. And we will talk more about each of these as well, but like it also goes into different techniques and methods. So if you're interested in doing like 
um, alternative processes or learning more about like Polaroid photography. Um, this book has that in it and is a really good resource if you're looking more to learn about the medium of photography and its kind of history without kind of being, you know, the 600 page textbook that's a little unwieldy. Um, this one I think you can buy for like $15. Gonna admit somebody. So um, between the two of them, it's about 30 bucks, which again, you don't have to buy for this course, but they're really great resources if you're looking for something physical to hold. So, and just a reminder for the dates, it's Saturdays at 11 a.m. Um, and, and we'll have, I'll generally open it a little early if you have any questions or if you wanna do a one-on-one -on -one before or after, please let me know, I'm happy to do that. So this week, again, we're doing the technical introduction and the origins of photography. Any questions, please just pop them in the chat, happy to answer. So one thing I'd like you all to know, you don't need fancy equipment to take great photographs. Um, there are so many Instagram accounts of people who use phone photography to capture the everyday in a really beautiful way. Um, you know, the cover of, you know, Time magazine was a phone photograph this year. So that, that has happened and been a thing. So I just don't want you to think that you need to invest $5,000 into a really nice camera to take really great photographs. So we're going to talk about it all. Um, and if, you know, as we move forward, you know, looking at cameras might be something you're interested in, but also know that your phone is a great tool. Um, and also any digital cameras, film cameras, it's, it's not the equipment that makes the photograph. It's really what you can do with it. So the origins of photography was really exciting. And I get a little nerdy here because I'm, it's just magic. <laughs> photography is magic. So if we look here, so, Aristotle and a bunch of like Chinese philosophers were looking at the way the eclipse looked through the trees. So this image is of the eclipse through the trees. So what happens is the sun gets, you know, covered over. This is a solar eclipse. It gets covered over and then it makes these crescent shapes. It projects those through the trees. And they were really inspired and interested in how this was happening. You know, it's normally just circles and you kind of take it as circles. But doing this, they're like, this is, the light is behaving differently. It's actually projecting itself through the little holes in the trees. How fascinating. And this really starts to lead them to, to what does light project into and why does it do that? And so we run into this, photography began before they could actually adhere light to a surface. So we're now used to photography as a capturing of that light, but for a while it was just, it's this light writing. So it's photo meaning light, graphy meaning writing. So it's writing with light, it's, it's really light based. And so that's something that you need to pay attention to as we move along because it's really based in that light. Light is very, very important. I'm so excited. It is exciting, it's so much fun. So what happens here, is we get a little, um, this is the camera obscura. So what they found was the light is shining through the trees and it's projecting, that's crazy. What if we put a hole somewhere else? So they made a darkened room and they put a hole in the, in the door in the window in the little wall here. And they found that light would project through, they'd project through that little hole into the space. And so this isn't using electricity. It's not using any sort of lens or camera mechanism. It's just a hole in the wall in a very dark room. And it's projecting what's happening outside inside. Okay. I know it's crazy because it sounds insane, but it's true. And you can even get it to do that now. And this means that if you're walking by it, you're, you will be then projected in there. It's a real life thing. It's not, it's not static. It's moving with the outside. So if you put it outside your window right now, you could get, you know, maybe if cars or birds or whatever's outside is projected inside. Magic, right? Well, it's actually based, it's called the camera obscura. That's what this mechanism is. And you can see here, it's upside down, backwards, it's all, all flipped. Um, and that seems kind of wild, except it's the same process that happens with your eye. Your eye receives information and it has to go through this flipping process within, within so that your brain can understand it. And the same thing's happening with the camera, the way light's coming in is you know, upside down and all this all jumbled up and then we're able to flip it in the same way our brain is able to do it. 
So here's another illustration of that. You can see they map it out of the A and the B and you can see how it's flipped. Um, and the camera obscura was a really great tool in, that they believe contributed to the Renaissance because they were able to really get proportions correct. They could trace what was happening outside, inside their studios or on walls and make these giant paintings that were perfect because they were actually just tracing what was already happening. And this is a picture of a camera obscura now um, that you can, you can recreate this in your home. It doesn't require anything too fancy, mostly uh, garbage bags and a little hole. Um, but this is a contemporary version of that that you can see. And it is pretty dim, um, depending on if you're using a lens or just a hole, it can be pretty dim sometimes. And this is going through the same system that you might see in, in a camera as well. So when I said that they use it in art making, this is a great example of how, you know, this is pre making the image adhere to something. So the light's coming into that lens at B, coming in. And then it's hitting that mirror, which then is lighting up this glass part, glass part that then the artist has a piece of paper on and they're tracing what's in front of that box. You know, it's not quite a camera, but it's kind of a camera. Um, and so it's this tracing box that they were using this photography, these photography ideas to fuel their tracing. So this is the oldest known surviving camera photograph. So they have all of these resources. They're like, we can bring light in and this is what it does, but we can't get it to adhere to anything. We can't capture it. And so in 1826 or 1827, the date is unclear, this photograph was taken. And this is one photograph. And, and so as we talk about photo history, it's important to note that like what we are looking at generally is photographs of photographs on screens. So it's always gonna look a little different. So you can see it in person, it's gonna look different from the computer, from Google. Um, but these are three different photographs of the same photograph. And so this was put on metal. You can see it's got that shiny reflective surface and it's pretty faded. Um, photography can be a little fragile. So this being one of the very first methods, it's very fragile and it was an eight hour exposure. So this was taken by Niepsifor Niepps. Um, it was an eight hour exposure and it was this like great moment, light burned onto this metal. We're so excited, everyone's pumped, but he dies a few years later without actually improving the invention. So now we get to the kind of drama of it. Uh, we get to fight for the title of who's gonna be the father of photography. We've got three inventors who are gonna, who are gonna fight it out. So we've got Louis Daguerre, Hippolyte Bayard, and Henry Fox Talbot. And so this is the 1830s and 40s, and they are working to come up with the best way that a camera can actually capture light. And we think about capturing and it feels just like, you know, oh, I'll, I'll, I'll capture this moment, but it's really, they are stealing light, they're adhering it to something and like capturing it for the first time getting reality. Now we can see they all have pictures. So one of them was successful. Um, so we're gonna dive into their, their messy drama just to, cause it's quite a fascinating, uh, quite a fascinating saga. So Henry Fox Talbot, this is the uh, salt paper and calliotype process. So he is up in England, he's working, he's a, he's a scientist who really likes to document his plants. So he does a system where he puts the paper down and then he puts his, uh, his plants on top and then he shines a light on it. And then he has a beautiful imprint of his plants. And he's really excited about it. England's really excited about it. Um, but he doesn't start using a camera until a little bit later. He's just using light sensitive photo paper. Um, he also loved calculus, just in case you were wondering. So he's up there in England. And then we've got Louis Daguerre. And Daguerre worked for Niepce, who took the first photograph. He was his assistant. So he got all of those documents when uh, Niepce died. And so he founded a daguerreotype process, which involves a camera and glass plates and a lot of uh, chemicals that are pretty toxic. Um, and he actually took this picture here on the left, on the bottom here, is the first photograph of a person. There's a little, little tiny person there. Uh, this is a 15 minute exposure. And that little person in the bottom left 
um, right at the turn of the of the street there is getting their shoes shoe shined. And so they were standing there for 15 minutes getting their shoes shined. So they didn't move fast enough. This is a very busy street, but over 15 minutes, everything disappears. So he founded the daguerreotype process. He was pretty excited about it. Um, and we've got Hippolyte Bayard, who did the first self-portrait, created the direct positive prints process, and curated the first exhibition of photographs in 1839, which is relatively recent. In terms of art, um, photography is really new, um, but it's been a, you know, obviously a great tool. So <laughs> the drama as it is, um, we've got... Henry Fox Talbot is up in Britain. He's hanging out up there. We've got Louis Daguerre and Hippolyte Bayard in France. And so they're kind of in the same realm and they both have a kind of mutual friend. And that friend advises Hippolyte Bayard to talk to the Academy of Fine Art and Science next month. Don't go this month, you're not ready, it's not time. And so he encourages his friend Daguerre to go and present his work to the Academy. The Academy says, Daguerre, you've done it. You're amazing, congratulations. This is awesome, we'll buy it, give you a lifetime stipend, we'll pay you money, great job. And so Hippolyte Bayard just didn't present as early enough. And so he ended up uh, kind of shunned and really poor at the end of it. And so he was very upset. And, um, and there's a lot of feuding, but it ends up that he takes the first self portrait. He is so upset that he didn't get his time and that he didn't get the invention and the money of the French government. So he makes a self-portrait and publishes it. It has some text with it that I'm going to read. Um, and it's, it's, you know, a touch dramatic. So here we have that. This image is what he took as his self-portrait. And this is the text. So the corpse which you see here is that of M. Bayard, inventor of the process that has just been shown to you. As far as I know, this experimenter has been occupied for about three years with his discovery. The government, which has been only too generous to Monsieur Daguerre, has said it can do nothing for Monsieur Bayard, and the poor wretch has drowned himself. He has been at the morgue for several days, and no one has recognized or claimed him. Ladies and gentlemen, you'd better pass along for fear of offending your sense of smell, for as you can observe, the face and hands of the gentleman are beginning to decay. So he decided to do the first self-portrait because he was so upset about this and really started then using photography as a tool for self-expression. It had largely been used to document landscapes, to photograph plants. Um, and this is a really, really great example of photography being used to, to express one's feelings and even to perform for the camera. So it's really exciting. And this is, you know, 1840s is when this is really going on. And photography is fragile, it's hard to deal with. There are very few people that are really able to master such a difficult um, medium. I have seized the light, I have arrested its flight. So this is a quote um, from Daguerre about photography and that kind of joy of capturing the light. And, and our, our phones are wonderful, but we're kind of sometimes get to lose that of that. We are literally, the process on film is that you are kind of burning light into a light sensitive material. And that like when you have it open, when you have your camera open, that light is coming in and burning onto it. And then a series of chemicals then enact that and show you that. And so now we have our phones that are able to open and close the shutter so fast and give us such beautiful photographs so quickly. And this magic of photography is really exciting that we're literally just, it's, it is actual light streaming in and burning things. And now we have it, we've captured reality is just complete magic to me. And, and if you ever get a chance to be in a dark room or use film photography, you can feel that a little bit more, but there's also something so beautiful about what we're able to do with digital. And it's just a really exciting time. So we are gonna kind of dive in now to the three elements of exposure. Um, you're gonna have a lot of questions about this. This is something that is gonna be the basis of photography. So if you have questions, feel free to put them in. Um, we'll review this a bunch of times from here on out. So if you're, if you're sitting there and you're like, oh, I really need more time with, with these elements of exposure, that's okay. We're gonna review it kind of every time so that we can understand it. And if your camera can't um, change these things, like a phone camera, sometimes they can't, that's okay. 
They'll help us understand some of the history of photography and why it, uh, why it does the things it does. So here's a fun picture, Rambo photographing a butterfly. Um, there's also a lot of photo theory talking about, you know, how photography uses a lot of the same language as hunting too, like shooting, capturing, you know, you do a lot of like sometimes stalking your vic victims of things. And so it's really interesting to think of it as a, as a weapon too, because it's a, quite a tool. So we're going to talk a little bit about light. This is the basis for everything we're doing. Photography literally is light in the title. Um, and we're going to talk about it. So this is a light meter. Um, it measures light. This is a model. This is a studio. Light is important. Here we go. So shooting on manual mode. Manual mode, depending on your camera, and again, this is where one-on-ones really help. If you bring your camera to the one-on-one -on -one that we do virtually, I can help you kind of figure out where these buttons might be and any questions you might have about that. So this might be what the back of your camera looks like and has all of these different things. We're only gonna focus on the three big ones right now. Um, and if you're on a phone, some of them now have pro mode or different settings where you can change these three elements. So if you do have that, your phone's a great place to get started and play around with because it's really fun. I know um, a lot of the newer phones have them, um, but you can also just play around with these ideas without using manual mode um, on your camera or on your phone. So these are the three big guys. This is ISO, shutter speed, and aperture. So if you are talking, you're muted, just everybody in case you have questions about it too. So, um, but ISO, shutter speed, and aperture, these are three elements of photography for exposure. So this is just kind of baseline exposure, but they're also going to change some of the stylistic choices we have here too. So this ISO used to be just, this is ISO. Ta-da! So ISO used to mean the film sensitivity. So if you used to buy film or still do, you'll notice that it comes in like 100, 200, 125, 400, 3200. Um, that, that is a number that relates to the film sensitivity. So some film is really sensitive to light um, and some film is not that sensitive to light. And you can set your camera sensor to be incredibly sensitive to light or not sensitive to light or medium. Um, but it's all based on this idea that your sensor can be different levels of sensitive, but film was kind of always one level of sensitive and you bought the roll knowing that it would be that level of sensitive. So that's where it's based in and where it is now. Um, and this is a great quote about it. ISO was once explained to me as the worker bees. If you have it set at 100, it is like you are setting, sending out 100 worker bees to bring back the light for you. If you set it higher, 1600 for example, you send out more worker bees, 1600 in this case, to bring back light for you. The lower the number, the less light. And the more we talk about this, you know, perhaps the more confusing it gets sometimes. So I encourage you to go out and play with any cameras you have if you are using ISO. If you're using a phone, you might notice um, that sometimes at night you get an image like the one with ISO 3200 that has a lot of what's, you know, noise in it. And that noise can make it look less appealing. And that's generally because it's really dark and your phone's trying its hardest to make it so that there's some light in the image. So this is something to be mindful of as you're shooting. You're gonna get more light that comes in that is absorbed, but sometimes you're gonna get more noise or grain. So, and this can happen here when it's just really dark and really got a, uh, it's a high number ISO. So if you have any questions about ISO, please let me know. Feel free to also email, put it in the chat, just say something now too. Um, but this is something you're gonna play with as you kind of figure out your sweet spot. Um, and it's just a really fun, it's fun, it's helpful. All right, aperture this is a really fun one. So I don't know if you've seen the new phones, but a lot of the new phones have like three cameras on the back of them. And this is largely because of aperture. Aperture is the open, opening of the lens. So you see here, the lens is open different amounts and it's kind of like your eye, your eye 
your eye will open and close based on if it's dark or bright. And it's pretty much the same system. Um, the, there are some consequences of aperture that are really fun too. So if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat. Um, so aperture, I'm gonna take a little coffee. <laughs> So aperture, there's all these numbers. We can talk more about them later, but aperture is just how wide the opening is for light to come through. So it's a little tiny opening, not a lot of light is gonna come through. Really big opening, a lot of light is gonna come through. So here's a way that aperture changes exposure. You can see that it, it really does change the amount of light that comes in and then how much is in the actual image at the end. And depth of field is a side effect of aperture. And it's really exciting. Um, now, if you'll, if you'll join me in for this. Okay, so put your hand in front of your face. Okay, put your hand in front of your face and look at it. Bring it real close to your face and look at it. What's gonna happen is if you see around your hand, the background is getting really blurry. You see how that's really blurry. You can't really see any of the details. You can just see your hand unless you go to look at that. And then your hand is really blurry. So you're looking at your hand, the background is blurry. That's depth of field. Um, and it happens in your vision, but it also happens in the camera. So you'll notice if you like look at maybe a chair or something in the maybe four feet away, you can look at that and the background's a little blurry, but you can still see it pretty well. So this is happening in your vision all the time. You're pretty used to it, but you can manipulate that in the camera so that maybe the whole scene, including your hand, and the background is all in focus, or you can have it be even more dramatic than you're seeing it. So depth of field you can see here is great, great visual of it. So you've got someone waving there and different amounts of like the mountains or the pyramids behind him is in focus. And so a lot of people like, it's really common in portrait photography to have it be the person's in focus and the background isn't in focus at all. And this is done with aperture. So you'll notice that aperture with a lower number, now that is a wider opening. The aperture with a lower number, with a higher number, is a much smaller opening. And that means that things are more in focus um, throughout the entire image. So here we've got a great example of really shallow depth of field and what that does. So this is a shallow depth of field. You've got the little, little front of those in focus, but then it immediately becomes out of focus. So, and this is another example, you can see how in the background of this, the images, the sticks start to become blurry. You can still see they're there, but they're a little blurry. Okay, and this is an Ansel Adams photograph. And one of the reasons people love his photography is because he photographed with such detail throughout the whole image. And so remember over here, we have F22. That is generally the smallest hole most cameras do now. So if you have a uh, what's called a DSLR, which is a camera with a detachable lens, F22 is probably your max, is probably the most small it can get. But Ansel Adams made a special camera that went to F64. It's like a pinhole. It's like a tiny little, just a little, little hole. And so he would do his exposures for a long time and let in a very little amount of light so that he could get, you can see in this image that the like ripples on the water are in focus as well as the trees up close, but the mountains are perfectly in focus as well. So he has miles and miles of depth of field happening where you can really see all of the information. So this is something a few of you said you like landscape photography. If this is like, if you love Ansel Adams, it's like, F64, this is what you do. You want it to be all in focus. You want the clouds to have perfect clarity. You know, and, and there's certainly different ways to photograph, but this is something that is just so in their technical wheelhouse. Um, and he also formed a whole, there was the F64 group, which was all a bunch of photographers who went out and photographed in this style, um, really trying to capture all of the information that they could. So here's another one. Um, if you ever get to see Ansel Adams in person, it's really beautiful because um, he was also a master printmaker. So here's another example of depth of field. We'll see on the left side, F2.8, that's a big open, big open uh, aperture. And you can see that one 
flowers in focus, but as you go back, they get uh, more abstracted. Um, and then as you up the uh, aperture and close it down, the more information you have for a longer um, distance. So this one we can see if this is a great example for portrait photography, we have the image up top has an aperture that is, you know, the trees aren't in focus, but they're not the primary focus. So you can see, you can see those leaves, you can see it, and you can see the person. And in the one below, it's really just that you can see her face. The background is so abstracted that you can't really even tell where she is, whereas you might be able to place her in the one up top. So this is the same thing. It's in front of the same object. It's just the depth of field is so different. Um, and this is another example of large and smaller, like narrower depth of field. So um, also, I don't know if that's like a cat or bear or like Tony the Tiger kind of Garfield-esque creature in this image, but it is uh, giving you that larger depth of field and that is through aperture. Also, if you're looking to do something like this, which is really fun, this was an Instagram thing where you go to ugly places and take beautiful photographs. A lot of this is done through shallow depths of field. So you see this model, she's in this like Michaels, I would assume. And the background is so blurry because of that um, aperture that it looks like she's in a studio almost. And here we have it again. You can really see the model perfectly, fa like you can see the detail in her face, but as you go further down, that is really, that detail is really falling off. And it's just like if you're looking at your hand, trying to see the rest of the world, this is gonna be in focus and this isn't. Here's another great example. We've got quite a blurry background. We've got a model up front that is very in focus and that is shallow depth of field made through aperture. Here it is again. Uh, and what you'll see, if you see right behind her head, do you see how those are becoming little circles? how the like little water droplets are becoming circles. Well, that's done through, you'll see it on, if you've ever taken like a Christmas card photo and you have those like trees in the background and they turn into these little blue, these little orbs of light. Has that ever happened to anyone? So anyone, you can give like a little, I see some head nods. Mm -hmm. um, that has its own title and it's called bokeh. Um, so bokeh is another kind of side effect of a side effect where you get these little circles. And so these are circles of light that are very out of focus. And it's really fun if you have lights that are, you know, like Christmas lights are perfect for it. When you hang them up, they form this beautiful interaction with the background and can be really romantic. You can also do it with city lights, car lights, um, anything that's kind of stationary and out of focus um, and is producing light will do this little circle thing if you have a shallow depth of field. So you can see that here again, we've got the thing in focus up front, but in the back is a shallow depth of field bokeh is happening there. So aperture, it's really fun to play with. Um, and you can do that also if you're doing up close photography or macro photography, you can have it so that something's in like up close and in focus and the things in the background are more, more the, uh, uh, it's there, but it's not quite there. You know what it is, but you can't quite see all the information. So it's really nice if you're taking portraits, for example, of someone, you can take them in what might be a somewhat ugly place and make it look really beautiful by hiding some of the information by making it blurry there. So that's aperture and ISO. And now we're gonna move into shutter speed. Now, shutter speed is, is our third element. So we're almost through it, um, our third element. And when you're taking a picture, you hear that ch-chunk of the camera. Does everyone know that sound, a little ch-chunk? Mm -hmm. So sometimes you might notice like your phone says like, oh, hold it a little longer, um, or it just mm -hmm. takes a little longer to take the photograph or it goes chunk, chunk. Mm -hmm. That is the actual camera mechanism um, opening and closing. Mm -hmm. So if you look at your phone camera even, you can like look here and when you take a picture, it's gonna open and close. You're gonna see a little, a little thing that happens right there and that's the shutter opening and closing. So shutter speed is what stops motion. So if you, if you wanna catch somebody 
running. You're going to have to get them at a certain speed. And these numbers correlate to tenths of a second or hundredths of a second. So one over 500 is one five hundredth of a second. Very fast. Um, one half, that's half of a second. And you can see half of a second, that person's pretty blurry. And that's what's happening at like at dark basketball games that makes them blurry is that that shutter speed is open and closed, but they're moving too quickly. So we're just kind of catching them as they leave. So this is something really important in sports photography. Um, in weddings too, you don't wanna like catch the uh, bridal party dancing and they're all just blurs. Um, and it's just really great too, because you're gonna have a little bit of shake anyway um, in your hand, your hand is just filled with energy. Um, so it's good to know that at certain shutter speeds, you'll kind of, you'll kind of have a little bit of natural shake. So, and it can be used really artistically. So here at, on the left, you'll see one over 1 60th. That is capturing that wave hitting. You see the beautiful like spray that's happening, perfectly captured, just poof, we got it. Four seconds, you're seeing the wave hit and go back. And that's what that kind of, you see that pull of the water and the light there? That's because it's crashed and it's gone. And so now you don't have that fine detail, but you have this marker of time, this like kind of rhythm that you're getting into with the waves. And this could be something that you find really beautiful. Um, you know, some people use it for dancers to show their movement throughout the space. Um, and some people want the dancer jumping and frozen. And so you really do that through shutter speed. Here's another example. You have, you can capture a pinwheel looking like it's not moving with a very fast shutter speed and a slower shutter speed is gonna blend all of those colors together. Okay, and so if you wanted to capture a city at night and you wanted this to happen, these are light trails that are caused by cars going up and down uh, a highway you would just leave your shutter speed open for a long time. And then what you see here is like, let's say it's a 10 second exposure. You see the, the imprint of the car's light for a long period of time. The camera is capturing that imprint as it goes through. And that I think is really cool because we get to see time pass through the photograph. You know, those cars started up here and we got to watch their journey back. And that's really exciting. And that's something that we can do with shutter speed. Okay, we could also capture very, very fast uh, movements. This is a bullet going through an apple. Um, and this, this, used, this was an MIT project. They, you have to time it just right with the gun. So I wouldn't recommend this because it's gonna be really hard to get everything sorted without the algorithm and computer. But it's really exciting that cameras can open and close fast enough to capture the bullet exiting exiting an apple and getting the explosion of the inside of an apple. It's, you know, we're, we're capturing such detail here. You could also, if you're looking to capture dogs, um, you could also get them in the studio kind of thing and capture them very quickly and get their faces as they're moving around because it's really fun. Here's a bunch of dogs doing that because what joy and what, we don't get to see this. Our, our eyes can't pause this moment. You know, our eyes can't do it, but a camera can. A camera can look at that and go, I've got it. <laughs> look how awesome this is. And for better or worse, um, we all kind of think that we blink just straight down with both eyes at the same time. After you've, if you've shot weddings or portraits, you'll know people blink kind of like this, very slowly one eye first. And then you get a bunch of pictures of someone like, like that. Um, and, and it's not always flattering, um, but these dogs really pull it off and look very cute doing it. So how does this all fit together? We've learned three different types of, of elements of exposure. And really what I would encourage you to do is prioritize what your camera can do and, and what you want artistically. So if you're like, I'm a landscape photographer, I want this whole scene in focus. Then you're gonna be looking more, then you're like, all right, I want it all in focus. I'm gonna go F22 for my aperture. It's gonna be a really small hole. Awesome, we're gonna do it everything else has to adjust. So the other two are gonna be like F22, great idea. Here's what we gotta do for shutter speed and here's what we have to do for ISO. And so you, most cameras have like an aperture priority or a shutter speed priority, and then we'll adjust the other two for you. Um, 
But also if you're shooting digital, you can play. I mean, take a thousand bad photographs. No one's going to know. They're not going to know. You can delete them. You can keep them. Um, and just don't be afraid of messing up here because you're, you're not really going to utilize any resources that, you know, it's not like you're going to ruin a canvas if you don't do it well. And really embrace that photography is as much about learning from these failures as it is like getting it right. And you certainly, very few people get it right the first time. Even really famous photographers, if they're sent out on a job or going to take portraits of someone, even if it's the queen, they're going to take at least 10 to you know 3,000 while they're there and then pick from those. So don't think that you have to be perfect here and just really be comfortable in playing with some of these things. Even if you end up with really blurry photos sometimes, that's okay. So here's a chart of those three things. This is not like a pick from one column thing. It's more just to show you what these things do in one space. So aperture, that small aperture, that little hole is gonna be everything's in focus. Um, like there's a really large depth of field. You're capturing the person and the mountain and everything's in focus. Oh, F1.4 is when you're gonna get just the person and kind of the illusion of mountains behind them. Um, and it's a wide open, it lets in a lot of light. Shutter speed, a really fast shutter speed totally captures movement. You know, it captures a horse, it captures a person. Um, it depends on how fast a car is going to capture the car. Um, but if you slow it down, then you're gonna see motion blur. And that could be a really desired effect or it could be something that you're like, you know what? It's not, it's not going well for me. And ISO, it really does affect, it's tough to really understand ISO without just going out and playing with it. ISO 50 is not gonna be very bright. It, it will still be a great image. It's not gonna be too sensitive. So ISO is your camera's sensitivity to light. And so ISO 50 means it's not very sensitive, but ISO 25,600 means that it's very sensitive and it's almost, it's, it's really stressed about being sensitive. And so there's a lot of, you know, those worker bees in there that are working really hard to bring that light for you, but they're gonna kind of muck up the image in a different way. So you can see those effects of what each of these do. And so if you're like, hey, I'm I love what F2.8 is doing. Awesome, love it. Then you can go like F2.8 and then, and then adjust from there. And we're gonna be working on this for the next several weeks. This is really kind of one of the hardest concepts in photography is these three things. If you can master these three things and really understand exposure, you're gonna be all set to do manual mode. Um, and there's a lot that goes into composition and actual like what makes a good image. Um, but this is just what makes a properly exposed image. So don't worry too much about it either. If you're like, I just want to take better pictures on my phone. I don't want to mess with this. That's okay. But it's going to help us a lot as we learn more about other about photographers, um, both working now and photo history. Um, so that we can really understand why some of these images are great because you know shallow depth of field is really exciting as is you know the larger depth of field so that's where we are right now <laughs> let's breathe it out there's a lot more information that i want to like share but i understand that that was a lot to get through right now so iso shutter speed and aperture those are the three pillars here now what <laughs> let's do a few questions I would just love to hear what kind of cameras you're using and what you're kind of looking for um, to learn about your cameras. Just, you could type it in the chat or you could say it now, just what kind of cameras you're using. If you know if it has ISO shutter speed or aperture, um, now would be, I'd love to just like hear that from you. So if you wanna type it in or say it now would be great. And if you also don't know what camera you want to use, or if you're looking to get a new camera, that's totally okay. I'm happy to help however you see. We've got an iPhone 10. Thanks, Anna. Nice. We've got Nikons and iPhones, mirrorless, DSLR phones. Perfect. I have a Nikon. I got it for Christmas and it has all this ISO aperture and all that. And so I need to learn to use that. Perfect, great. All right, so awesome. Thank you all so much. That'll help. We've got so many mirrorless. You guys are, are, are new, I love it. 
All right, we've got Canon Rebels. Canon Rebel was the uh, camera I fell in love with photography on. Um, I still have mine too, because I love it so much. Nice, nice, great. So for those of you with the phones, I, I have a, a Samsung phone. So do the iPhone people, do you have, do you have like the three lenses on the back of yours for some of you? Yeah, okay. So that's mostly for the, um, for the different apertures. And so I, they have a pro mode and there's different ways that they can do it. So amazing. So um, with that, I'll do a little bit of stuff next week on, since we have so many, we have so many iPhones and Canon Rebels. So we'll talk more about those um, specifically. Um, but I can also talk with the mirrorless folks too, and we can make sure you know where those where those buttons are, because sometimes they're really hard to find, and then they're also hard to change. Um, full manual mode should be able to, if you're able to look up what kind of um, manual your camera has, a lot of places have those online. Um, that's great. Uh, but you can also just start playing with like aperture priority mode, shutter mode. You can just like play a little bit. And that's really fun. Again, you do not have to do like homework for this class, but I'm happy to see what you might have come up with. And if you're able to do things, it's really fun to explore photography in that way. Um, oh, I'm trying to get, so I have, I have these kind of weekly challenges of things that are really fun, whoops. Weekly challenges if you're interested. So instead of, you can dive into the camera this week, but one thing that is really kind of captures me as the like, magic of photography, this like oh, moment where you get to like really see why it's so special is making a camera obscura. I'm going to send you a, a video link. It's only four minutes, um, but it teaches you how to make a camera obscura. And all you really need for that is like a trash bag, some tape and a little bit of time and a window. Um, it, it, you, you black out your windows with the trash bag and tape, and then you, um, you really just make sure it's light sent, like just no lights coming in. And then you like put a little pinprick kind of thing right there. Um, some people will use like eyeglasses that'll make the light brighter, but really any sort of little hole that you put in there, it's going to project the light through. And there's a few, a few different ways to do it, but really you need uh, black trash bags tape and just time to, to block out that light. Um, so I'm going to send you a link for that. Feel free to do it. Uh, we'll spend the first like five minutes talking about that if anyone did it and really kind of getting your feedback on what that experience is like to be in the room where the projection from outside is coming in, uh, a live stream, if you will, from the outside. Um, and we'll get to talk about that. I'm gonna do one uh, over, over the next week too so we can talk about that together. And it's just really fun. And again, if you have questions while you're doing it, you now all have my cell phone number too. So feel free to call. Um, and also if you wanna set up the one-on-ones, um, we can do a few throughout. So if you're like, hey, I wanna talk, I wanna talk this week so I can learn about where the buttons are on my camera. And then I wanna talk in three weeks to really zone in on landscape photography with you. That's totally fine. And if you're like, hey, I actually just wanna explore this on my own. Please don't, please leave me alone. I don't wanna do a one-on-one. -on -one. That's okay too. Um, I'd love to engage with you in some way, but I also understand you're busy and uh, you've, you're doing a lot of Zoom things, I'm sure. So don't feel too pressured. Um, we are just excited you're here and working on your photography with us. Um, next week, we're going to be talking about lighting, composition, some great 20th century photographers, and we're going to be diving into portraits. And portraits are really fun because you get to really understand light this way, and a lot of the techniques that we started working on um, talking about today, you get to put in place and like, how can you use aperture, ISO, and shutter speed to make better portraits and to really light your subjects in a great way. So if there are any questions, you guys, please ask those now. Does anyone have any questions for that for next week or this week? You should always keep ISO like as low as possible, right? Isn't that sort of the rule? Yeah, um, a lot of people, a lot of people do that. So it does depend, um, but I typically try to keep it as low as possible. Some, some cameras have a native ISO that's like, 
600 or so, that's like where their optimal speed is, um, optimal sensitivity. But I okay. generally keep mine at 100 to 500. Um, but in darker situations, I'll go up to 800. But if you start to go up to 1600 and you're looking to blow it up like this big and print it, then you'll run into some troubles probably. You would only, I mean, I guess you would only need to really blow up your ISO if you have like a fixed, um, you know, aperture and shutter speed that you were trying to use in, but it was underexposing, I guess, or I guess it all depends. Never mind. It, it all depends. It, you're, you're right. And it all depends. Um, because what happens is like, so if you're, let's say you're in a basketball gym and you're like, I have to, like my shutter speed needs to be this fast or anywhere you are, like ISO can be really flexible because it doesn't affect too much of the artistic style, but it sometimes does add too much noise. So it looks great. It looks up, uh, not great, but it is more flexible than the other two generally. So gotcha. I found that it works really well in like dark wedding venues, bumping up your ISO is important. And like dark gyms is really going to be, but when you're outside, you're just going to have it kind of at a general temp, general thing. And if you're inside in a, in a dark house too, um, ISO is going to be changed more frequently than it would if you're just outside for a whole session. Cool. Thanks. Cool. Any other questions today? Okay. If you think about it over the next week, I do want to be mindful that we're doing like a kind of hour so that you can get back to the rest of your day. But if you have questions or are looking for any more feedback or interactions, please let me know. Happy to hang out and, uh, and help you with anything. So that's our intro. Um, we'll review some things next week. And if you have questions, please let me know. I'm thrilled you're here and I hope you all have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you. That thank was great. You. Great. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your well, weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks you so much. Bye. Thanks. Bye.